Alright, I am going to try this phone thing again because, oh, if I can get it set up, because, well, the alternative using my computer camera is just too horrible. Ugh, okay. Anyway, well, welcome back to An Atheist Reads the Book of Mormon. Uh, we're on the third book, Jacob. Uh, this was much shorter and overall a much more enjoyable read than Second Nephi. So I'll just quickly remind you that we're still on the small plates of Nephi, which are primarily for religious and theological purposes, as opposed to the large plates, which are more for historical purposes. Uh, as the title tells you, Jacob is the narrator. Um, he is one of Nephi's brothers. Um, so right at the beginning, Nephi turns over the task of writing on the plates to him. Uh, Jacob points out that there are many, many groups of people at this point, but um, he's just going to lump them into two categories, the Nephites if they are friendly to his, to him, and the Lamanites if they are foes of his people. So that makes it much easier on the reader because he lists a whole bunch of, of groups of people that there are at this point, and it would be a nightmare to keep track of all that. Um, so Nephi dies right in the first chapter. Uh, also, the Nephites start to stray from the righteous path. Um, now, one fascinating tidbit is that right here in the first and then again in the second chapter, polygamy is listed as one of the wicked practices. So if anyone ever tries to tell you that the Book of Mormon condones polygamy, then they are wrong. It actually condemns it. And now you can point them to Jacob 1 and 2. Um, Jacob warns against these th sins for a few chapters, and in a fascinating turn of events, the Lamanites actually become the more righteous group than the, than the Nephites. So remember, God actually cursed the skin to be dark due to their wickedness, and now the Lamanites are the righteous ones. Uh, then there's some talk of reconciling themselves to God through atonement and theological things like that for a few chapters. Uh, then there's a very long allegory about tame and wild olive trees. Uh, the symbol, the symbolization, the symbolization, is that a word? Uh, the symbols are quite overt, but in the following chapter, Jacob explains it anyway. You must follow Christ to avoid burning in a lake of fire. So, uh, so that's what he says to do. Uh, and now probably the most interesting part of this book is that this guy, Sherem, appears and he denies the prophecies and demands proof of God. Uh, it is a little unsettling how similar his types of arguments against God mirror current day atheists. He basically goes around convincing people to deconvert, but then Jacob speaks to him using the power of the Holy Ghost and Sherem falls to the ground. Uh, several days later he awakens and he denies everything that he taught the people, he that he was deceiving them and the devil had made him do it, um, and then he dies. So this incident actually causes the Nephites to come back to God. Uh, they even try converting the Lamanites, but the Lamanites hate them, and they apparently love war, is the exact quote, too much. So the fighting continues um, between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Uh, then Jacob gets old and near his death, so he tells his son Enos to continue making records on the plates. So that's the next book, the Book of Enos. So you can look forward to that in pro probably one or two days. It's only like two pages long, so...